What's up, noobs? Noobs. I love you. I love you. So, um, it's me, Tracker. Dun, 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 dun. With another video, an instructional video, a PSA about PR. Talk about some things that I didn't mention previously instead of trying to edit everything together or something. Um, I'm going to talk about like what control points look like and shit like that. And so there's, there's control points that are in play and control points that are not in play. And um, in an AAS match, you can tell when a control point is in play because it will have this cute little thing oh my cursor my cursor is not going to come up it will have this cute little thing you can see like right right next to airstrip objective there's this flag there's this little chinese flag that says that's that's in our cap right now okay that's in our cap that's ours um and then there's also this little sort of like purple shield icon on top of that flag not all flags have that all flags can have that, but not all do at all times, because check it out. Supply fortification objective doesn't have it, but airstrip objective does. Now, what's so special about airstrip objective for God, for, for, well, you know, for, for any reason? What's so special about airstrip objective? Well, it's in play. It happens to be in play. It is capturable. If enemy get to it, and get into the capture zone, the cap zone, in sufficient numbers, they can capture it, which means they can turn the flag to their favor, and then this other flag, one of these other flags, would become in play, and then it would need to be defended because it would be vulnerable to capture. God damn it, I can't get to this one. Okay. All right. Oh my god. Uh. Okay, so in this map, for example, Oh, I can actually, I can point, oh, this is going to be badass. Okay, so in this map, <laughs> this is awesome. In this map, this control point right here, if it gets capped and it turns American, then I think the next one is supply fortification. It will get that little, that thing will turn orange, meaning it's the objective that we have the initiative to attack and um, like on the opponent's map right now in this match that is, that's got a little orange thing on it which means that's where they have to attack and that's the only thing on the island that they can attack this other thing here if they get that then they can attack this one or this one over here I forget which is next but there's this order and it's called capture order and it is linear Sometimes, in some matches, like, okay, over here in, uh, um, like, in, uh, remember someone, let me just, uh, get this for you here. So, okay. Oh, it's gonna be sketchy. Sketchy, sketchy, sketchy. But, okay, there are some maps where at some times you can legitimately have uh, two control points that are both capturable um, and are both in play. This happens. Okay, so uh, this is not a perfect example. What is the map that I... Uh, what happened on that map? Here. Stuff went down. Here we go. Before. See, see if Squad okay. Seven is capping. If they're here, we go. So, right. Okay. So obviously it's not right now on the map, but like this is the first flag that the U.S. has 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 to capture right here. So the U.S. is from there to there, while Mech is going from there to there. Right. Mech has to capture that little town and make it theirs. The U.S., I think, has this from the beginning where you need to go there before you can capture that, but it's easy. But I think Mech, I think Mech starts out with, like, this and these two or something, and America starts out with this and... Uh, no. 
all these three, I think, are neutral in the beginning. And then, uh, well, anyway, after America caps this, then they can actually attack either of these two control points, which sort of gives them a tactical advantage on taking those spots because they can just, as I explained in the previous video, when you have two options of places to attack, it's advantageous, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so here we go. So this is, like, near the beginning of the round. We had captured that. We had all our armor over here and airship and whatever. We uh, we had stuff going on in the chem weapons facility. This is a example of a objective that sort of makes itself happen because it's just a strategically important position for everybody to be on so everybody wants to be there and then these two control <laughs> these these two control points right here are both available to us at the same time for attack and so the enemy has uh, has little purple shields on both of them this one they don't have to care about unless both of these become American. So you have to, like, so America has to capture one of them and then defend that while capturing the other one. And then both of them are up for attack. So they have to defend both of them while they also attack uh, the town. So I would say that the best idea for America in this round... My, my typical strategy if I was just approaching this from like, okay, let's just win it would be to take oil field, make the bunker and demo pit areas just uninhabitable um, and make the whole desert inhospitable to American forces wait a minute no, that would, that's the max strategy. The American strategy is to make both of those control points uninhabitable and to make the entire desert uh, hostile to mech forces. So it's basically a matter of, like, uh, you know, if both teams are playing this carefully, they, were, they are actually going to stay off of um, these two objectives, which right now are... America is going for because they are um, I guess they're easy to take but they're easy to lose as well and just every time you take something and lose it you're volunteering casualties so unless you really do feel like your guys are just better than their guys uh, and are in a better mood than their guys are um, you don't really want to you don't really want to do stuff in there. You don't really want to go there. It just kind of sucks to be there. I mean, at the same time, if you really want to hold it, it's easy to hold. But I'm getting distracted. You know, this is this is the case of, like, this is a map where... And there's spots in Mutra that are like this, too, where you get these situations where you got to hold two control points. And these are kind of... These are strategically important spots. Every spot is has a different kind of, like, profile of how you have to defend it and stuff like that. And so these spots where there's, like, two control points up at once, and then the next one is just a single control point, um, they are kind of like roadblocks in the road to victory, and you want to be very aware of when you're crossing them, when your team is crossing them. But that's how flags work. Um, they get captured in a specific order, <coughs> it's usually a certain amount of geographic, you know, linearity to it. It's just one one thing after another between two opposing bases across a map. And that's the basics of the game. If it's if it's a insurgency game, then the uh, the control points in play are the known caches. Those are the, uh, you know, relevant objectives at any given time. The unknown caches, although they do provide people with a place to spawn, are basically, you know, it's just so that you can know ahead of time. It's just intel. In a lot of cases, the insurgent team would perform better if they didn't know where their caches were. That's sort of an interesting aspect of being on the insurgent team. On either team, you want to be aware of what your motion looks like to the enemy uh, I was commanding on this round 
uh, right here. Okay, so here's an example of where you might think somebody's cheating on the opposite team, where you're, you're just like, I don't know how the fuck they found us. This is, this is, you know, right, impossible. But in fact, it's not terribly hard. Like you can be found. This is me spotting uh, stuff with the UAV. This is relatively easy to do. I'm communicating my observations with the squad leads that are on the scene at the time. This is me scoping out an enemy fob that has just been built in uh, the same compound as we have a friendly fob up. So we had uh, we had a fob fight. Not really a fob fight. Like if there was two attack fobs within shooting distance of each other, they the crews just noticed each other because there's a bunch of smoke in between. That would have been a really awesome fight here, but they were sort of they were kind of further back behind these other buildings and shit like that. But this is, you know, Cassie you can be spotted doing, doing stuff. So when you're out. cruising around it's compounds and stuff like that, that's why people say, like, hug the walls, hug the I edges of map so features. Be conscientious of what you look like from above because you never know when you're going to by a UAV by the commander and even the insurgent forces have UAVs. So there's always eyes in the sky that may be able to see you. Um, of course, there's no point being too paranoid about that because there's only one eye in the sky. <laughs> but you can be observed by, uh, by close air support helicopters, they don't have to be close. Commander. They can be observing from so far away, so high up that your forces never be able to see them. They can be as omnipotent as a commander with his UAV and uh, a, a little bit of chit chat. Here's, here's yeah, where I spot the enemy, the enemy fob. So I'm like, oh, you know what? Right, right. So this is so squad five is chilling. Um, so that's that's squad five. That's that's the friendly fob right there. That's where squad five has made their their awesome fob. Those guys were so cool. So that's the friendly fob, and then up in the in the top right here in the southeastern corner, we got an enemy fob that they are that they just built. So our guys finished their fob right when the enemy were starting to build their fob. Neither crew is aware of each other, but I gave our team a tactical advantage by telling our guys what was up. Because they wouldn't have known otherwise. They had no reason to know. We didn't have other elements in the air. We didn't have other eyes on them. And so I was like, okay, that's probably the best use of the UAV. I think I was probably right. What the fuck is that? Because it was a clusterfuck everywhere else, and that was the only control point that really mattered in this game, and I kind of wish everybody had just defended it, because it's much more defensible than the stupid city, unless you're going to take the entire city. This is the thing, like, you got to be... Uh, it's, it's about what you can commit to. Like, in this, on this map, we did not have the coordination of resources to take this whole stupid little town. What we did have the ability to take and hold was this, but we had the, we did not have the willingness to commit that ability. We did not have the willingness to commit to uh, discipline that it takes to stay out of that downtown, and we didn't have the uh, wisdom to see the downtown as the perfect opportunity to do some ticket farming. That downtown is perfect for fucking ticket farming. Perfect for it's so easy, so easy to. Um, just light a bonfire and throw a bunch of enemy tickets on it, but instead we threw our own tickets on that bonfire. And uh, I think we still... Did we win this match? I can't remember. I think we actually got DC'd out of this move. Can we win it? Stuff happened, stuff continued to happen. Oh, yeah. I got this. The server crashed. Ah, uh, but anyway, you know. Um, oh, yeah, I also wanted to say something about it. Okay. When you. Um, oh, my God, my oatmeal is so fucking bland.
all about that vanilla, that coconut oil, and that freaking maple syrup. That's what makes it Canadian. So, when you are troops in contact, you're moving on some objective. Um, and you go down you have a judgment call to make you have to decide am I going to respawn and trickle in re like try to get back here without asking what's up because I don't want to distract those who are still in contact do I try to get a medic now assuming that it's going to get harder as the contact continues at the risk of distracting my medic or do I hold, hold spawn, say nothing, or do I hold spawn and say something like, I'm down, you're down to five guys. That's what I think is the best thing to do. You just say, um, like whatever your class is, like if you're an automatic rifleman, you go AR down, you're down to seven guys. Next guy goes down is the medic. He says, medic down, you're down to six guys. It's not too bad, you know, like, or like, once you get down to four guys left or something, the person that dies says, like, okay. You know, I'm down, I'm the reacher, that's half of us. Or something quick like that. Just really quick. If you keep calm super brief, it's not so bad. Um... If you keep a run-on sentence going, it's just like, you just should get kicked for that. Just for having a run-on sentence going on during contact. Because that's just brutal. Um, this is why you kind of want to maintain awareness of where the medic is. And make sure that the medic always has access to you. So make sure that you are in a position that the medic has access to at any given time. And that you are within hollering distance of that medic. So that you can go, MEDIC! in local, right, without distracting everybody. Everybody can hear where you went down and stuff like that. This is why you want to stay within shouting distance of each other so that you can hear each other in local. So, Because when you can hear somebody in local, it is so much more meaningful. Um, this is the other thing I want to talk about a little bit in terms of like what comms to use at what times. You want to use squad comms when you're not describing something where you need everybody to know where you are, you're not close to people, whatever. When you are close to someone and you want to say, hey, to our to our right, use uh, local for it. When you are trying to say, like, hey, medic, over here, obviously use local. When you're, um, you know, when you're trying to call somebody back to you, say, stop, hey, come back. Um, they might not know who you're talking to unless you use local. If you're in squad chat, they're not going to know where you are. If you're curious, you can use both. You can broadcast on both at the same time. It's not a terrible, mean thing to do. You can just go ahead and do it. I often broadcast on local when I am talking between squads so that my squad mates can hear that I'm having another conversation. They can hear my end of the conversation. And, um, I, you know, I might be able to patch through some of what some other squads are saying through that channel, through my like speakers and microphone, and so they can hear that there's a conversation going on, which is helpful, because then they're less likely to interrupt or whatever. You know. I, I have less in the way of needs, you know, in terms of, like, briefing them about the conversation afterwards or something. I don't have to say things twice. So, uh, it's useful to use local to, um, echo some comms that you're doing on another channel if you kind of, if you want you know, if you're like if you're talking to the whole squad and you're next to only one squad mate or something like that and they don't know who you are and you don't know who they are and they're not necessarily, like, you're not necessarily looking in the little corner of each other's screens where all this stuff takes place. You're not necessarily paying attention to that little thing. You're probably looking right here, right in front of you where shit is going down. Like, look, 90% of this game happens right here. It's like the mid between the bass and the treble of a song. 
this central area of the screen occupies most of your time. So when people are fucking talking to you and they expect you to know who they are and stuff, um, this is the the point of run-on sentences. Is sometimes you want to do it. You want to say something slowly so that it takes a long time to say so that your little thing is on the screen for long enough to somebody for somebody to look at it, um, which is going to take them a f- two, maybe two to even four seconds if they're in the middle of doing something from the time that you start saying something. So if you're saying something where you need somebody to be able to look up your tag name, to look up your position or something like that, then um, you're going to want to take like five seconds to do it. Um, but if you're trying to not be disruptive over comms, you want to keep that five seconds very simple. So like, doctor, I'm over here. I'm over here. This is why people say, just like say weird, say things in weird ways in PR. Like it's, it's part of the culture, whatever, to say things in a weird way. It's part of the, the, you know, how people talk within squads, but there are some reasons for some of the verbal weirdness that occurs in game. Some of it is actually is actually a functional thing. It's actually a communication thing, which I think makes it kind of fun. So I'm gonna leave you with a little bit of a little bit more encouragement for all the noobs out there who might be a little frustrated on the battlefield with getting treated like shit, like they don't matter, and like they're not welcome. Um, guys, it's not about that, honestly. If, pe- if people are treating you like shit, it's either because they're dumbasses and they are. Let me just reassure you all that dumbasses are in the minority in this community. I don't care what anybody says. We're just complaining, and. Um, People are just impatient. People want to have a really good gaming experience. People want to uh, be rewarded for what they're putting into the game. And um, people are overwhelmed. So people are just trying to protect their attention span from disintegration. And so 90% of the time when people are pissed off with you, it is simply because you're eroding their ability to concentrate. And so you just need to settle down and take a longer view approach to the game you know, you don't need to be demanding rally points, you don't need to be demanding to be spawned in you don't need to be demanding anything you just need to not be putting yourself in uh, stupid positions not getting yourself you know, messed with unnecessarily and also not being too careful, not pulling up too much you want to find that medium where you are keeping up, you are aware of what's going on, and you're um, looking out for yourself as well, and you're supporting each other. You're supporting a common effort. Like, if you're in a squad full of people, you want to have one mission at a time. You want to have a mission, and then you want to know a few things that you might be doing next. If you're the squad lead, You're in the same boat. You want to be doing one thing, and you just want to be keeping your people alive. You have a responsibility to them. To, to, you know, to, to deliver them a decent gaming experience. It's a big responsibility. Like, if you do not fulfill it, you're gonna kind of feel shitty about it. You're gonna feel bad about it. So, you have to deliver a good gaming experience to them. You have to consider what they want to do. And you have to make them want to do what you want to do. And that you have to convince them of its value. Um, and in order to do that, you know, you have to have some confidence in what you want to do. And confidence just comes from uh, just knowledge, just knowing. Confidence comes from conviction, really. It comes from knowing what has to be done. Uh, and knowing who around you knows more about that and who around you knows less about that. You need to be able to evaluate each other's credibility about stuff, and you need to be able to deliver credibility in order to get loyalty, in in order to get support. So, you know, if you don't have that conviction, if you don't have that certainty 
then don't try to communicate it and don't try to share it if you don't have it. If you need a strategy, if you're squad leading and you don't know what to do, then you need to give your dudes the task of coming up with suggestions. And then you need to pick your favorite. You need to pick what... And then as soon as you pick, you take ownership of that plan. That is now your responsibility. That is not their idea anymore. That is their suggestion that you christened as the plan of action. Um, And if you don't have a plan of action, then... You don't want to be committing resources to a non-plan. Uh, and when you plan to do something, you have to figure out how you're going to do it. You know, if you're like, I, there's nothing worse than driving into a control point that you're supposed to capture with no plan of how far are you driving. You know, where does everybody want to deploy when they get out? How spaced out do we want to be? Do we know what's inside this compound? Any of that? When there's no discussion of it whatsoever, fuck the driver doesn't know what the deal is. If you're playing it ultra loose like that, then everybody's got to play it ultra loose like that and chill. But not everybody's ready to do that, so you got to sort of have like a common vibe going. Mm. But it's really nice to play in different ways. Like, that's the whole point. If you're getting sick of something, if you're getting sick of the way something's being done in-game by most people, then you have the ability, you have a golden opportunity to introduce something different into the game just by squad leading or by manning or just by doing something different in game but squad leading is your opportunity to do that you can make somebody's achieve a consensus lead them in a squad and accomplish awesome things by doing something different you can do something totally different you don't have to do things the normal PR way you can introduce a new way a new vibe into the game that's what's so fun about it. You got, you know, join the squad. You're in the squad leader's world. They can impose all sorts of crazy stuff. You can leave at any time, but they can impose all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, their own style. That's part of it. That's really cool. I met people from all over the world. I've been bossed around by people from all sorts of places, close and far. It's been awesome. There's a few accents that I understand a little better now. Mm. All right. Well, well, noobs, spec ops pros, supposed to go on the battlefield.